Good evening, everybody. Almost hit my head on one of those light bulbs coming through. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2. Jeremiah, chapter 2. Father, we pray for a blessing on your word here this evening. We believe what you say about your word, that it's living, that it's active, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And now we want to yield ourselves to your word and to the ministry of your word, how your Holy Spirit takes the word and works it within us. Please do that this evening, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 2 uh, continues the prophetic ministry of the young prophet Jeremiah. We saw last week when we began the book into chapter 1 that God called Jeremiah to this ministry as a prophet, to this work as a prophet, when he was a young man. And that he was called of God to serve God in a critical time in the nation of Judah's uh, history. Where judgment was impending. It was on the horizon. The Babylonians were poised to conquer and sweep away the kingdom of Judah. I reflected on that this week, how foreign that is to us as an idea, living as Americans in America in the 21st century. We, we don't have any memory, either in our immediate lifetimes as Americans, I know there may be people from other nations here, but as Americans, or uh, in, in our national history, in any time in the region, do we have this idea of being invaded and conquered and carried away by a foreign power? Friends, that's what happened to the kingdom of Judah. Now, it did not happen in Jeremiah's day, or at least at this point in his ministry. When we read in Jeremiah chapter 2, it's still far off on the horizon, but it's out there. And Jeremiah calls the people of God to repent and prepare first now if perhaps that judgment might be avoided. Here we go, Jeremiah chapter 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness in a land not sown, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. Okay, those first few words of verse 2, go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem. This reminds us that the work of Jeremiah the prophet, especially in this chapter, these were prophecies delivered to the southern kingdom of Judah. Jerusalem was the capital city. And notice what God says in verse 2. It's so warm. It's so tender. He says this, I remember you, the kindness of your youth. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God made a very heartfelt appeal to his people, basically saying this, I remember our relationship for what it once was. Friends, isn't that a heart-rending appeal? C can you think of a troubled marriage, a husband and wife who aren't getting along, and, and the husband appeals to his wife and says basically this, I remember how you used to love me. And it's just sort of heartbreaking, isn't it? That's the idea here. God is talking to, to Jerusalem. He's talking to Judah. And he says, I remember what we once had in a relationship. We don't have it anymore. It's spoiled. It's done. You're rebellious. You don't want me anymore. And he's going to detail how that works out in the rest of the chapter. But I just want you to get felt by the heartfelt appeal of this. And how God is seeking to woo, to win Israel back. It's just full of passion. I love you. I want it to be like it once was. Remember when we loved each other. Remember when we were together. My friends, in our own relationship with God, just doesn't it hit us that strongly sometimes? I hope I'm not the only one in this room to whom I feel like the Holy Spirit has spoken to me like that in some time with my walk with God. He says, I remember what it's like. Look at how he explains it. He says, I, I, 
I remember the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them. In other words, when we had such a special relationship, and I protected you, oh man, anybody messed with you, Israel, I was all over them. When we had that kind of tight relationship, people of God, nobody could cross you without having to cross me first. But now look what's waiting on the horizon. It's the Babylonians, and I'm just going to let them devour you because you've gone far from me. Verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me? that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. Neither did they say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, and through a land of drought and shadow of death, through a land no one crossed and no one dwelt? I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land, and you made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. What a word God brings against his disobedient people in those verses. Notice how he begins first with the appeal in verse 5 where he simply asks, what injustice have your fathers found in me that they've gone far from me? Why? What was the reason? When you went far from me, when you turned your back on me, whether it was in a moment or whether it was in a process, why? What was the reason? You, you, you left me because I did what to you, God says? What injustice was there in me? God says, well, prove it. Bring it to case. Instead, he says, going on, verse 7 and other things in that context, he says, I brought you into a bountiful country and its fruit and its goodness. Israel, don't you remember how good I have been to you? Now, friends, I got to say, I got convicted by this, this whole relation of God. Don't you remember how good I treated you in the wilderness? Don't you remember the land I gave to you? Don't you remember all the ways that I blessed you? And then I remember this. Do you know how long it was before this when God brought Israel into the land? 800 years before the time of Jeremiah. And then I thought, you know what? I I can understand why a nation or a people would take something for granted after 800 years. What What I can't understand is why I take something for granted for God after eight days. But that's what they had come. Yeah, the land, so what? We have it, it's ours. God says, no, this was my precious gift to you. Don't you receive it anymore? And it makes me reflect on all the precious gifts that God has given to me that I take for granted. And then as if that's not enough, God makes a challenge. Look at it there in verse 8. He's challenging four classes of leaders in Israel. First he speaks to the priests. He says, the priests did not say, where is the Lord? Then he speaks to those who handle the law. Those who handle the law did not know me. By the way, it's a very interesting phrase, those who handle the law. This probably refers to the Levites and those who were supposed to teach the law, the Bible teachers. And friends, it's a scary thing. You can handle the law and not know God. Isn't that frightening? So the priests, he said, did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law, the Bible teachers, did not say, know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The governmental rulers, they, they transgressed against God. And then finally, he says, the prophets, they prophesied by Baal. The leadership of Israel let them down. And didn't lead them before the Lord as they should. So then he says, verse 9. Therefore I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord. And against your children's children I will bring charges. For pass beyond the coast of Cyprus and sea. Send to Kedar and consider diligently to see if there's ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods? Which are not gods. But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. God says, okay, your leaders have let you down, your priests, your Bible teachers, your rulers, your your, uh, prophets, they've all let you down. 
goes, let me bring my charges against you. And what's his charge? It's really something fascinating. He says it very powerfully. Look at it there in verse 10. See if there's ever been such a thing, verse 11, has a nation changed its gods which are not gods. God says this. You know the Canaanites are pretty faithful to Baal. The Egyptians are pretty faithful to their Egyptian pagan gods. The Assyrians are faithful to their Assyrian gods. Isn't it funny? The only nation that wants to change its god is the one that has the true and living God, Yahweh. Has he ever seen such a thing as this? He says, look all around. it. Look beyond the coast of Cyprus. That's to the west. Or to Kedar. That's the east. Look from west to east all over the place. You'll never see this phenomenon that a nation turns its back on its gods and they're just stupid pagan idols. But you have the living God. And for some reason, you want to turn from him. Look at that indictment in verse 11, friends. It's very heavy. But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. The heathen nations were faithful to their gods, even though their gods did nothing for them. Yet Israel had the God of all glory who blessed them in innumerable ways, and they turned from him. Friends, think about it. Think about the man who serves his lusts. And because of his lusts, he's destroyed. Because of his lusts, his family is broken, his children are abandoned, his friends are distant from him. You know, because of all the marriages and alimony, he doesn't have a cent in the bank. And yet he will continue to serve that idol. He is so faithful to that idol, even though that idol of lust kicks him in the teeth every day. I would say this. I wish I would serve the Lord as faithfully as many people serve their lusts. And this is the contrast that he's trying to draw. Now you could apply that to any kind of idol that people commonly worship today, but I think you get the idea. And then he says, going on to verse 13, this is so powerful. He says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Verse 13 talks about two evils that the people of God committed. What's the first evil? Well, first of all, they forsook the Lord. They forsook him. They turned away from God. And what did they embrace? Or excuse me, they they turned away from God. They turned away from the fountain of living waters. Now, before you spiritualize living waters there, it was a very common phrase in Old Testament Near Eastern times. What living waters were is what we would call perhaps in our modern nomenclature, an artesian spring, a spring that naturally bubbles up from the surface. And if you've ever seen such a thing, it's just amazing. I mean, in a day when they didn't have water pumps and faucets where you could just turn on water, we're so spoiled in the modern age. We have no idea, do we, what it's like to have to carry your own water and dig your own wells and pump your own water and all of that. We're so spoiled, but we don't understand that in the ancient world, to have an artesian spring where the water came up all on its own and you didn't have to pump or dig or do anything, great, fresh, sweet water came to you all on its own, that was the best thing ever. So this was like, you forsake the Lord who's like this beautiful, sweet artesian spring. That's the first thing you do. God has been so good and so wonderful, and you forsake him. But then what do you do? The next thing, look at it there in verse 13. And they've hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Do you know what a cistern is? A cistern is kind of a fancy word for a reservoir. It's a reservoir sort of for personal use. And if you go to Israel today, you'll see ancient remains of a lot of ancient cisterns. They were digging them all the time because water management was very important in ancient Israel where you had to try to capture as much of the rainwater as you could so that you could use it later. So what they would do is they would dig out holes in the limestone and then they would plaster them the best that they could and then they would fill it up with water so that they would have a reservoir of water to use in the dry times. Here's the problem with two things. First of all, the water from the cistern never, ever in a hundred years tasted as good as the water that came from the living spring. Never. The, the water from the cistern always smelled bad and was nasty. Now, you'd use it in a pinch. If that's all you had, you used it. And you were grateful for it, but it was never as good as the water that came from the spring. That's the one thing. The second thing is, is inevitably those cisterns 
got cracked. And what happened with the cracked cistern? All the water that you worked so hard to put into the cistern vanished away. So the water you did get from a cistern was nasty. And number two, so often the water was gone because the cistern was broken or cracked. What a tremendous picture of the futility of going after other gods, of putting your focus off of the Lord and onto other things. You know, you gave your heart and your soul to the God of success. And you know what? You found out it's a broken cistern. You gave your heart and your soul to the God of whatever, of prestige, of romance, of what, you know, you could just go on and on. But you get the picture, don't you? And even if you succeed in it, you find out later it's broken and it holds no water. Going on now to verse 14. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he plundered? The young lions roared at him and growled. They made this land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitants. Also the people of Noph and Tophanes have broken the crown of your head. Have you not brought this on yourself? And that you've forsaken the Lord your God when he led you in the way? And now why take the road to Egypt or drink the waters of Sihor? Or why take the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Your own wickedness will correct you and your backslidings will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. You see, earlier in the chapter, God promised that he would defend an obedient Israel. But now prophetically, Jeremiah is looking at the time when they're conquered, when the invading armies have filled and they're gone and they're done. And now they're slaves on behalf of other people. They're plundered. Their land has laid waste. And look at his analysis in verse 17. He says, have you not brought this on yourself that you've forsaken the Lord your God? Why was Israel captive? And Jeremiah is looking forward with a prophetic eye. Why were her people slaves? Why were her cities burned? Because they forsook the Lord. Friends, you know, just to use sort of a figure of speech, <laughs> you could ask somebody in the disaster of their life who's forsaken the Lord, and they go on and they tell you about all the problems and when they turn their back on God and on and on, everything that's gone wrong in their life, and you just ask them that simple question, well, how's that working out for you? Hey, people of God, how did it work out for you when you forsook the Lord? They said, well, it's terrible. Now I'm a slave. My cities are laid waste. I've been captive. We're under the boot of the oppressor. Everything's gone. Well, it was desperately connected to this idea that you should have never forsaken the Lord. You shouldn't have trusted in Egypt. Verse 18, why take the road to Egypt? Why take the road to Assyria? God cautioned Jerusalem from looking to either Egypt or Assyria for help. You see, the waters of living water were nothing compared to the fountains that were found in the Lord. Instead, the waters of Egypt, I should say, or the waters of the Euphrates where Assyria was. Don't look to them. Rather, he says this in verse 19. Look at it carefully. Your own wickedness will correct you and your own backslidings will rebuke you. Friends, sometimes I think that I should write that particular verse on a great big piece of paper and use it in counseling. And when somebody who's turned their back on the Lord tells me about all the woe in their life, and it's not that I don't care, it's just I've kind of seen this one before. Maybe just slide that paper to them and have them read that verse. Your own wickedness will correct you, and your own backslidings will rebuke you. You see... If we won't listen to the correction of God in his word, if we won't listen to the rebuke of God as he brings it to us, then what do we leave ourselves for? For our own wickedness to correct us, for our own rebuke, for our own backslidings to rebuke us. And then they'll certainly know. Look at it there in verse 19. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God. Now verse 20. For of old I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds. And you said, I will not transgress when on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot. Stop right there. You said, look at that in verse 20, I will not transgress when what did you do? 
on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot. God here spoke of the idolatry of the northern kingdom of Israel as prostitution. He's speaking symbolically here. You see, in going after idols, Israel was like a wife that was so unfaithful to her husband that she was a harlot consorting with idols. Now, friends, this is allegorically speaking, of course, but it's an allegory connected with reality. Many of the pagan and Canaanite idols were worshipped by the Israelites in what we would essentially call today sex cults. They were honored, these gods, supposedly with ritual prostitution. And their idolatry was often connected with sexual immorality with both male prostitutes and female prostitutes. That's just how it was done. And therefore, when God says, notice it here again in verse 20, and 21, uh, verse 20, when he says, on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot. Notice that thing of the hill and the tree. We'll come back to that in a minute. But start again now at verse 21 where he says, Yet I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of the highest quality. How then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. How can you say I'm not polluted? I have not gone after the bales. See your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You are a swift dromedary breaking loose in her ways, a wild donkey used to the wilderness that sniffs at the wind in her desire in the time of mating. Who can turn her away? All those who seek her will not weary themselves. In the month, in her month, they will find her. Behold, your foot, excuse me, withhold your foot from being unshod and your throat from thirst. But you said, there is no hope. No, for I have loved aliens and after them I will go. Friends, let me unpack that very dramatic section for you, starting at verse 21. Well, actually, you can start back in verse 20. Starting back at verse 20, he links together many symbolic um, um, pictures to describe the sinfulness of Judah. Number one, you played like a harlot. Number two, you were like a degenerate plant of an alien vine. In other words, I planted you as a good and noble vine, a great thing that would grow wonderful grapes, but you've degenerated into a terrible weed. It says, even though you wash yourself with lye, you, you use this image, if you could dry yourself with any, or wash yourself with any kind of lye or soap, you won't get the spot out. And then he says very dramatically in verse 23, how can you say, I am not polluted, I have not gone after the bales, see your way in the valley, know what you have done. The valley there refers to the valley of Hinnom. The valley that runs along the west and the south of Jerusalem. On the PowerPoint picture that I have up right there, you can see it as sort of a, a line that goes through the middle of the picture. That's the very deep gorge, the valley of Hinnom. And it was inside of that valley that there was terrible idolatry unto both Baal, Asherah, and Molech, including child sacrifice. And notice the wording of God there in verse 23. He says very plainly, he says, how can you say I'm not polluted? I have not gone after the bales. See your way in the valley. Know what you have done. God says, I, I see it right there. How can you deny it? And then he uses two images. He talks about the swift dromedary. He's talking about a female young camel that's awkward in its steps. It can't step right. It's just wandering. It has no purpose. It almost trips over its own feet. And then it uses the picture of a female wild donkey. Did you see that picture? It's almost a little gross. It says, a wild donkey used in the wilderness that sniffs at the wind in her desire. The idea of that is of a female donkey, and look, in doing my you know, research, my preparation for tonight, I, I've read more about the habits of female donkeys in the wilderness than I ever wanted to know. So if I can say this without grossing you out, what a female donkey in the wilderness in these cultures do is they sniff at the dust that's been soaked with the urine of the male donkey. 
when they're in heat, this is what the female donkey does. And when it smells the dust stained with the urine of the male donkey, that female donkey goes crazy. And it'll chase down any male donkey it sees. It looks for the donkey that left that scent, and it will chase him down. And the whole point is, if you look at the text there in Jeremiah, the point that God is making is, the idols didn't have to pursue you. You ran after them. Just like a female donkey in the wilderness runs after the mate, says, please, I want you. That's how you ran after the idols. And friends, can I just say, sometimes it's shameful. And, and if this is your shame, then just repent of it tonight. There's cleansing in Jesus Christ, I can tell you. But if it's your shame, let's own up to it. Isn't it shameful sometimes, not just that we sin, but how we sin. We can't wait to sin. We plot it, we plan it, we prepare it, we run after it. And if that's your sin, there is forgiveness, there's cleansing in the blood of Jesus, but just be real about it before God. This is the picture that he's painting of someone who chases after sin and then going on to verse 26, he says this, as the thief is ashamed when he's found out, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They and their kings and their princes and their priests and their prophets saying to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone, you gave birth to me. Friends, actually, that is very funny the way he explains that. Because this is what I understand. Look at those verses again. First of all, in verse 26, he says, as a thief is ashamed when he's found out, that it is, so is the house of Israel ashamed. When is the thief ashamed? When he's caught. That's how Israel is as well. That's how the people of God were. They were ashamed not to be practicing their sin, but to be caught in their sin. And then look at what it says there in verse 27. Saying to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone, you gave birth to me. Friends, characteristic of the idolatry that Israel was often involved in in the ancient world were two deities, and you've heard me mention these before, I trust, Baal and Asherah. Baal was the leading male deity among the Canaanites. Baal was represented in the temples by different statues and stuff, but one thing that they often had was a distinctive, and I, I don't know how to say this tenderly, so I'm just going to say it, a, a, a distinctive phallic symbol of a stone. And this is what they worshipped in there. Th these were sex cults. And so there was a phallic symbol of a stone there in the temple. And archaeologists have discovered many, many of these stones all over the place. It's nothing unusual to discover in Israel. How was Asherah represented? Asherah was represented, it's a little interesting, by a wooden pole. Now the pole was not a phallic symbol. The pole was a representation of a tree which was thought to represent the feminine. A, a tree being fruitful, I suppose, a, a tree being shelter. I don't know exactly all the purposes behind it. But the tree was thought to represent the feminine. And in an indoor temple, they represented Asherah with a wooden pole that probably they decorated with different things. How do they know that these were all over ancient Israel? Because they confined the uh, temples and the altars where they had a, a, a slot that that wooden pole went into. I mean, the pole was made out of wood. It perished a long time ago but they can tell the place where the pole was set into. So this is what he says. And again, I know it's a little complicated, but understand this. It's very interesting in verse 26, 27. Saying to a tree, that's Asherah, the feminine principle, you are my father. It's backwards. But Jeremiah means that intentionally. This is how confused you are. This is how stupid it is. Look at verse 27. Saying to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone, the male principle, you gave birth to me. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. And Jeremiah says, exactly. This is how much sense your idolatry makes. Now, picking up again, the middle of verse 27. For they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, arise and save us. But where are your gods that you have made for yourselves? Let them arise if they can save you in the time of your trouble. For according to the number of your cities are your gods, O Judah. Hey, when the Babylonians come, 
Call on Baal and see how much good that does you. Call on Asherah and see how much it helps you. They have nothing to help you with. These gods that you have trusted in. Verse 29. Why will you plead with me? You you have all transgressed against me, says the Lord. In vain I have chastened your children. They received no correction. The sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of darkness? Why do my people say we are lords? We will come no more to you. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me without days, without number. You know, God says there in verse 29, why will you plead with me? You have all transgressed against me. You know, here God says, you you, you won't even repent to me properly. Instead, you forget about me. Look at that in verse 32. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Here's the idea. Israel's rejection of God was unnatural. That's something like this. Can a bride forget her wedding dress? It's unnatural for her to do so. I, I don't know what your custom is. I know that for Ingalil, we have some kind of hermetically sealed box with her wedding dress in, stored somewhere or another. I'm sure many of you ladies have the same thing. It's just not forgotten. Or, uses that thing, or a bride, her attire, that's not talking about the wedding dress. That's talking about the distinctive sash that a married woman would wear in Israel to designate that she was married. It was something like a wedding ring. So you're saying a bride forgets about her wedding ring, forgets about her wedding dress. She has no desire for it. It's gone. It's erased from her memory. That's unnatural, God says, and it is unnatural the way that you have forgotten me. Now, verse 33 to the end of the chapter. Why do you beautify your way to seek love? Therefore, you have also taught the wicked women your ways. Also on your skirts is found the blood of the lives of poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but plainly on all these things. Friends, I got to say, verse 33, look at that one again. The question Why do you beautify your way to seek love? Israel felt that their pursuit of love, by the way, I'm sure that's what they called it. I'm sure that's what they called it when they went to the temple for the cultic prostitution. I'm sure that's what they called it when they were involved with those various sex cults. Love. You see, what Israel assumed was that their pursuit of what they called love was self-justifying. And that any pursuit of what they called love was self, uh, was automatically made it good because they called it love. Do you know what God says? He says, why do you beautify your way to seek love? The love of idols in the eyes of Israel was just as good as the love of Yahweh, their covenant love, God. And God says, no. You see, friends, put it like this. The love expressed in what Yahweh calls sexual immorality, that was not just as good as love expressed in what Yahweh calls sexual morality. You can seek to beautify that love. You can seek to beautify that kind of, well, we should call it for what it mostly is, lust. But God will just ask you the question, why do you beautify your way to seek love? But then look at it there in verse 34. Also on your skirts is found the blood of the lives of the poor innocents. You see, in ancient Israel, Their immoral love, which they called beautiful, left them stained with the blood of the poor innocents. Can I spell it out to you? When the sex cults are operating, in the ancient world especially, there were a lot of unwanted pregnancies. 
And nobody wanted to raise those children. The women, the prostitutes who gave birth to them, who were often of a character that were unsuited to be mothers of those children. And so it was in particular those kind of children that would have been sacrificed as the child sacrifices to the grotesque gods Baal and Molech. And God says, your skirts are stained with this innocent blood all tied back to your effort to beautify what you call love. Friends, it's not a long line from us to the modern day. And and I know what we say. We say, listen, boy, we're so happy today that we have effective birth control and that those things kind of happen. Then why? Why are the clinics where they um, eliminate unwanted children, why are they so busy? And how many poor innocents suffer because of the immorality of another person? How many children go to bed without two parents in the home because of the immorality in that marriage? And who suffers? Well, everybody suffers, but among them, the poor innocents. You see, friends, today many people seek to justify any pursuit of love is beautiful, such as the supposedly beautiful pursuit of love in adultery, in premarital sex, in perversions, in homosexuality, and God doesn't agree with those justifications. And then many of those also teach others their ways, advocating them in the general society, hoping to normalize that which at one time was considered sinful or perverted. Look at it right there in verse 33. Why do you beautify your way to seek love? Therefore, you have also taught the wicked women your ways. It's not just enough for you to do it. You feel better about it if you can draw more people into it as well. It's not just misery that loves company. Sometimes it's guilt that loves company as well. And it's the poor innocents that suffer. Unborn children are killed. Homes are wrecked. And perversion forces itself upon innocence. But look at verse 35. Yet you say... Because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead my case against you because you say I have not sinned. Why do you gad about so much to change your way? Also, you shall be ashamed of Egypt as you were ashamed of Assyria. Indeed, you will go forth from him with your hands on your head. For the Lord has rejected your trusted allies and you will not prosper by them. I think it's fascinating in verse 25. Despite the plain nature of their sin, Israel could still claim innocent. Did you see that line in verse 35? Because I am innocent. Friends, I, I think one of the greatest gifts we can have is just to be real before God and say, God, if you call it sin, I'll call it sin. And if I'm a sinner, then I know that Jesus Christ has come into this world to forgive sinners. It's so strange, isn't it? how much we resist agreeing with God's assessment of our own wickedness. As if we were to say, yes, I'm a sinner, I need Jesus, as if to act that that puts us outside of the kingdom, when really it brings us right on in. No, friends, as much as anything, a chapter like the second chapter of Jeremiah is a wake-up call to the people of God to be real to him, because if you don't, look at it there in verse 37. This was the result for Judah. Indeed, you will go forth from him with your hands on your head. What does he mean by that? Friends, when they depopulated Judah and took them as way as captives, there they are marching out with their hands on their head as captives and slaves going to Babylon. You're done. You're finished. It'll come upon you unless you turn. 
Why does God tell us or the people of Israel back in ancient times these things? Just to make us feel bad? Is that the whole purpose? I can't wait to come to Wednesday night and get beaten up by the word of God. Now listen, there is some benefit in getting beat up by the word of God, I believe. But friends, the answer isn't to get beat up. The answer is to look to our beautiful Savior. The answer is to look to the pure one, to the holy one. Because we have an advantage that Jeremiah never had. We have our Savior displayed for us. And so we say, yes, Jesus, I am a sinner. I need you. I I mourn over the ways that I see in myself that I run after sin. It doesn't have to run after me. I run after it. I see in the ways that I've been false or deceptive or deceptive towards you. Yes, Lord. I need you, and the Lord is ever there to forgive and to restore.